Okay. Well, today, yesterday I spoke about the need for disequilibrium economics, and today what I'll be talking about are the pioneers in disequilibrium economics. They're not re regarded as such or talked about as such in the academic literature, um, except for Schumpeter, who they talk about, you talk about evolution there. But I think fundamentally they're all saying you've got to analyse capitalism from the point of view of a system like, which is never at rest, always changing. And you can't do that by making a series of staccato steps from one equilibrium to another. You have to have something which says you're moving through time at all times, subject to forces which are due to the fact that the system is not at rest. So let's start with the first of those. But what I'll let's bring the slide up. Okay. Uh, and what I'm wondering about is where did I put a little comment I wanted to show to you guys? I think that's okay, coming up in a moment. Right. <laughs> Me mumbling away here. It's pretty early morning for the lecture as well as for the students. Okay, so last lecture I went through the need for dynamics, what disequilibrium is about, and instability as being a core feature of capitalism. And the pioneers I see in that area as being, these are not the only ones obviously, but the major ones, Marx. Uh, but I'll be t taking a very different approach to Marx to anything you've ever heard before, I hope. Schumpeter, Irving Fisher, whom I spoke a bit about last week, or yesterday rather, Keynes and Goodwin. And what I'll show tomorrow is how that's all integrated, not all of it, most of it integrated effectively in Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, which is why I see Minsky is so important. Uh, and so in this lecture I'll go through an overview of each of those pioneers. But before that, I want to say something about you people. Because I reckon Ecuador rocks. Because uh, yeah, looking at yesterday, how many of you downloaded Minsky? There were, were um, <laughs> fully 50% of the downloads yesterday were from Ecuador. <laughs> which means about 30 of you downloaded the program, at least. And I think, funnily enough, you've made my download thing look like a map of Ecuador. There's Galapagos Islands and there's Quito. So, uh, has anybody played with the software yet? Actually, had a go? What did you, could you, get a, could you get your head around it a bit? Did, thank you. That's what I'm trying to achieve, an intuitive interface. So you could actually work out what to do. And Did you, did you design any of the models? Not really. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, that's we're going to work on making it even better that way with the help of uh, the Ecuadorian government and some funding that may come uh, come along to keep it ticking over. So back now to talking about disequilibrium economics and the exponents of that area. And that's the first guy I'm going to mention. That's a younger look at Karl Marx. You normally see the old guy. This is, uh, I think he's in his 30s there. And my, as I said, my approach to Marx is very, very different to standard approaches to Marx. In fact, um, I get criticised more by Marxian economists, I think, than I do by neoclassicals. There are less Marxians, so I get less criticism, but on, on a per head basis, I probably annoy more Marxians than I do neoclassicals. And this comes from my arguments about how Marx's philosophy relates to his economics. And there was a strong push in the 1970s from uh, particularly a French uh, economist, economist called, uh, and philosopher called Louis Althusser, mainly philosopher, to say you should ignore Marx's dialectics. Um, and I think that's nonsense. And in fact, I remember being in a, a course with a friend of mine teaching uh, Marx, who told the students not to read the first seven chapters of Capital, because they were too confusing. Start at chapter eight. And I thought that was the most ludicrous advice I'd ever heard, because to me, the insights that actually made sense of Marx for me and ended up inverting what you, uh, what you took out of the chapters 8 to 27 occurred in chapters 1 to 7 and everything else Marx ever wrote. So I think his philosophy is pivotal and as, as cumbersome as it is, is expressed you'll get a, a coverage in those first seven chapters of Capital. Um, now most people when they think about Marx and dialectics talk about thesis, antithesis, synthesis and I'm saying those words carefully because they're bloody hard to pronounce, not because they're important. Okay. Um, I said yesterday that Marx never, in his, having written, read all his writings, he never actually used those concepts. That was a slight error. He did once when he was satirising Proudhon for the book called The Philosophy of Poverty. And he basically talked about, he called, called it Proudhon's nonsense. And then in that he talked about Proudhon saying, 
uh, labor value was a synthesis of use value and exchange value. And he said that was crap, effectively. So he did use it to, to abuse and satirize an opponent, not at all consciously. He had a much more sophisticated version of dialectics, but it's also much simpler. I can hardly even pronounce thesis, antithesis, synthesis, okay? How you apply it, I don't know. It's just a couple of, a few complicated words. So you can derive anything you like out of that, which is pretty much what Proudhon did when he tried to interpret uh, the labor theory of value. But what Marx had was something very, very different, and I think very simple. And it's implicit. Unfortunately, he never wrote about it as an explicit approach to his philosophy. But if you read everything he's written about the economics, you'll find it mentioned all the way through his writings from 1857 on. He didn't actually start turning up until 13 years after he started reading economics in 1844. But I think when you do that, you, you get rid of all the problems of the classical school, but you also get rid of the labor theory of value, the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, and the necessity of socialism. All those things which people identify with Marx also disappear when you interpret this properly. So his vision of, of dialectics involved those four concepts. A unity, a foreground, a background, and tension. Now, I think initially that might look about as vague as synthesis, antithesis, thesis. Yeah. Um, but the way it works is that Marx says that any, any component of society is a unity. So you, each of you is a unity. Flasco is, Flaxo is a unity. This bottle of drink here, which I'm glad to see, is a unity. And so that you, any object, whether it's a live or, or inanimate object, is a unity from Marx's starting point. And he said, those unities have an existence in their own right. So this coffee, you know, I, I can't dispute the existence of this cup of coffee. Okay. But it exists in a society. Okay. It's not in isolation. And because it exists in a society, you have to understand it from the context of that society. And the forces of that society will bring some aspects of this unity to the foreground. Now, why am I drinking coffee first thing in the morning? Because I've got to earn my living by lecturing to you guys, and it wakes me up. <laughs> Not just for the flavor. So in that sense, the foreground is the caffeine for me. But of course, the other aspects, uh, the, the, those other aspects of the unity still exist. So you can't get rid of them, they're still there. So the fact that society focuses on the foreground and pushes, therefore necessarily pushes other things into the background, means there's a tension between the two. So you get a tension between the foreground and the background. And that's what can give you development and change over time. And I think that's a very nice, simple idea of a philosophy of change, embedded right from the, from the foundation of Marx's thinking. And it gives you an explanation of many of the complexities in capitalism. Starting off with what, what is a source of profit, by the way, I'm now elaborating Marx to say we actually have to go beyond, even beyond the theory I've got here to argue that energy ultimately is the source of any surplus we consume. But I, I won't go into that in this lecture. Uh, but for example, as well as talking about where profit comes from, Marx's philosophy explains why wages are normally greater than subsistence. Now that contradicts a lot of Marx's thinking. And it also explains why we have a subjective basis for pricing money, capital assets, and new commodities, which again is not something you'll find in standard Marx, Marxian logic, but it is there in Marx. So you have this conflict between the foreground and the background aspect of any unity, and that can lead to change in the unity itself and also change in society. And the way that I visualize this is to imagine that's society, a big circle. Well, the unity would be a circle too, except that society focuses on a foreground and ignores the background. So what you get out of it is a dog bone. The foreground aspect is what society focuses upon. Therefore, the other aspects of that unity are pushed into the background, and you get a tension between the two. Well, that's my visual way of capturing Marx's concept of, of dialectics. And what it gives you is change rather than stability. This is not a system that's going to lead to equilibrium. Right from the very outset, your focus is always upon change and transformation. Ah, pardon me, I don't know up there. Now, the key dialectic is the commodity in capitalism. And Marx, has anybody here heard of a book called The Grundrisse? Anybody read it? Nobody, okay. It's Marx's rough drafts for capital. And 
it's as if somebody, imagine you were writing your PhD thesis and somebody found your raw notes and published your raw notes, everything you ever wrote about any book you ever read in one volume. That's what the Grandisa is. So you find it's where Marx's original thoughts come out. And if anybody gets a copy of the Grundrisse, then there's a one and a half page long footnote on page 267 of the Penguin edition, which I think is the standard. And you find that one and a half page footnote, that's where Marx discovers the use of dialectics and economics and identifies the commodity as the key dialectic. But he said the commodity is a unity of use value and exchange value. And here we're getting, rather than the utility maximising vision of neoclassical economics, we're getting a, a new starting point to talk about attention, the separation between these two. So he said the commodity is the unity. In capitalism, we'll focus upon the exchange value of the commodity. That's what matters to a capitalist. Okay? Not the use value, but the exchange value. But the commodity has to have a use value as well. That gets pushed into the background in capitalism. And therefore you get a tension between the use value and the exchange value of the commodity. That's, that's the starting vision. So there's your capitalist society. Now we're looking at commodity. Capitalism focuses upon the exchange value, which therefore sets the price. And the use value is irrelevant to price. So rather than saying they play a, a, a mediating role using marginal, uh, marginal utility and marginal cost, which is the standard neoclassical vision, this is saying they're separate. The use value doesn't play a role. Now, that is something which I know a lot of uh, neoclassicals would object to straight away and scoff at, but Marx had a good historical explanation for how this would come about as well. Because he said exchange involves particular social conditions. To alienate something you own at a price is not what we used to do in ancient human societies. We gave things away as a gift. A large part of our, our social formation was in small tribes, maybe about the size of this room, maybe, one, maybe twice this size, where you knew everybody and you worked collectively and your regard in that society came out of what you did for the collective group. So you would be giving things away all the time. It's much more a gift-based exchange society than a money-based society. To alienate and return for something back is something that happened on the periphery of those societies. So Marx said, objects are external, obviously, and therefore you can get rid of them. If I made this coffee back in you know, 25,000 years ago, apparently coffee was only discovered about, what, 500 years ago, you see in the literature. But maybe, maybe let's imagine I first invented coffee back in the Cro-Magnon days. And I'd be making it for my tribe. We'd be hyperactive compared to all other tribes. Okay? And then you meet a tribe which is lethargic on the border and they'd like some of this energy that my tribe has. Well, what have you got that's worth it? Okay. So it needs to be on a border between two societies for that to happen. And that's Marx said where, where, where this practice of alienating in return for something else came about. So he said this didn't happen in societies which were based on property in common. But it does happen when two societies based upon that meet at the boundary. And notice down here, I didn't know this, I didn't realise this until I uh, re-read this as I was writing these lectures. He says, uh, such a state of reciprocal independence has no existence in a primitive society based upon property in common, whether such society takes the form of blah, 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 or a Peruvian Inca state. Now, how widely was Marx reading to be aware of that in the mid-1800s? Okay. Um, well, he said exchange first therefore occurs on the boundary. Exchange in return for something back occurs on the boundary. And he said you therefore have to work out some ratio in which you exchange things. He said first of all when it happens, it's um, totally arbitrary. But once you start doing it as a matter of course, some sort of rule starts to develop. And he said that rule over time becomes based on the effort involved, as best, as best as you can understand it. Because ultimately, did I go through too, quick, too quickly through that slide, by the way? I'll go back up again, pardon me. Okay, so he says you have exchange first begins on the boundaries, points of contact. And first of all, they're by chance, but ultimately you start producing some of what the other tribe wants as a matter of course. You start developing the practice 
of producing this for exchange in return for what you, you can't produce that the other tribe does produce. I'm being a bit facetious with the coffee here. But has anybody read The Clan of the Cave Bear? Okay, there's a woman called Jean Aeul, A-U-E-L, I think, and she's written a large number of, of anthropologically based historical novels about Cro-Magnon society and Neanderthal society back when they both existed in Europe. And she has a whole range of invented but obviously real examples of how various things were invented on different tribes. So for example, one tribe might make soap. And you know how you make soap? You drop animal fat into charcoal. Okay. So one tribe would have noticed that, that suddenly anything that fell into the heath came out clean. And they'd get the idea, oh, hang on, animal fat, charcoal somehow, cleaning substance. So suddenly one tribe has got clean everything. Okay. Another tribe makes pottery. How does that happen? We all invent, most societies work with clay. But some people made clay drop that it falls in the fireplace and it hardens. Another, my favourite example, is a bit rude, but it's why not. And that is a woman who can make white leather in a particular tribe. And nobody knows how she can do it. Everybody else has got coloured animal clothing and she's got pure white, which looks marvellous. She urinated on it by accident, turned white. So all these things, one society knows how to do, another doesn't. Now initially, when you, when you have that situation and you see this fantastic white leather, you know, you'll give a ridiculous ratio of what you can make to get hold of that. But if you start having them producing the white leather for trade with you, then Marx said ultimately the ratios start to come down to the cost of production for you, rather than being based on your utility. You're no longer giving away something that is part of what you need. You're producing a surplus for trade. And that breaks the link between use value and exchange value. So he said, we, 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 you slowly develop the need for these objects, okay, and it becomes a normal social act to make those exchanges. And therefore, a while, after a while, your part of what you're producing is deliberately to produce for exchange. And you get a distinction between the utility of an object for using it in your own society for consumption and its utility for exchanging with another society. And he therefore says its use value becomes distinguished from its exchange value, foreground and background. Get the idea? So what you therefore get is an argument that the exchange value of a commodity sets its price. Its use value is largely irrelevant to price. I'm saying largely because it gets more complex later on. Now let's apply that logic to labour. Because in a capitalist society, labour becomes a commodity. That was not the case in a feudal society. You could not sell your labour. If you were a feudal worker, you were a property of the, the, the feudal mints on which you were born. And so alienating labour as a commodity was a particular phenomenon of capitalism. Well, the difference between the exchange value and the use value in this case is quantitative. Because why does a capitalist hire you? Because you can produce goods for sale, which you can put a quantitative numerical price on. That's your use value to the buyer. What is your exchange value? It's the cost of commodities that are needed to keep you alive while you work. If they're different to each other, there'll be a gap between the two. And therefore the capitalist can make a profit by hiring you. So this is Marx's logic uh, in what he called the MCM plus circuit, from money to commodities to more money. He said you have labour, and the four, what matters in capitalism is the foreground aspect, and that determines the subsistence wage. So your exchange value is the cost of your production, which is a largely a subsistence wage. But your background, your use value, and the reason why you'll be hired is because you can produce commodities for sale. The tension between the two is a source of surplus. So that was Marx's mature explanation for where labour produces a profit. Did that make sense? Okay. okay. Now, what about machinery? Well, this is where I'm going to start breaking away from Marx because exactly the same logic applies to a machine. If 
that the machine is also a commodity. The foreground aspect for the capitalist is, 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 is the exchange value of the commodity. What the capitalist is buying for is its use value, capacity to produce commodities. The gap between the two is exactly the same logic. So Marx's argument that labor is the only source of value is erroneous on his own terms. So here you have the same idea, making money. There's the machinery. The foreground is its exchange value. Therefore, you pay the cost of production of the machine to buy it. The background is its use value, ability to produce commodities for sale. The dialectical tension, it's also a source of surplus value. Now, Marx realizes this at one point in the Grundrisse and then rapidly retreats. It's quite intriguing to read how he writes that particular section. So Marx's logic contradicts the labor theory of value. And I said there's a major thing in favor of Marx's philosophy, but to explain it, I need more than my, my part of one lecture. So um, I've linked there to my PhD, uh, my, my master's thesis on Marx, which goes into this in great detail. So Marx does not have the labor theory of value if you read him properly. I'm therefore arguing that virtually every Marxist, about two exceptions, have read Marx wrongly by trying to preserve the labor theory of value. So I know I normally have a great fight with Marxists here, but I'm not going to stop for that. I'm going to keep on going and, and see what we can add on top of this. So first of all, you have all inputs to production being potential sources of surplus. Now let's look at the wage itself. I said the wage is the subsistence wage. But Marx, when you take a look at how he wrote, consistently said the value of labor power is the minimum wage. Not the actual wage, the minimum wage. And I've read, as I said, I've read everything Marx wrote on economics. And I found seven instances where he talked about the value of labor in conjunction with talking about the wage. And in every one of those seven instances, he said, value minimum wage. And here's one example. I was early on saying, for the time being, necessary labor supposes such, i.e. that the worker always obtains only the minimum of wages. And he then, what he's explaining is, he's taking a look at each of those levels of complexity that I've shown in the idea of a dialectic, and starting at the, the very foundation one, the commodity, then going on to where profit comes from, then wages, then capital machinery, another twist there, then money, then new commodities. So, but at each level he leaves out the complexities that apply at the next level. So here he's saying we're ignoring the fact that workers get more than the minimum value to work out profit early on in capital. Then he said these become fluid later on. This is in the Grundrisse. They had in 57 books of the Grundrisse. He said the natural price of labour is nothing but the minimum wage. That was back, yeah. Yeah. Then they, they're going to be able to, to raise the, the, the wages. So Actually, it fits in very well. What's that? It fits in very well with that. Uh, are you so? Yeah, because I'll show you in a moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then he said, the value of labor power is equal to the minimum of wages. This is, this is all actually before he worked out the, um, the, 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 actually 1861 is when he's starting to talk in terms of dialectics. The minimum wage alias the value of labor power, all the way through. So it's the minimum wage. What's the logic there? Again, it's a dialectical logic. Because labor is both a commodity, which is its foreground aspect, but a non-commodity, its background aspect. There's going to be a tension between the two. So if you're a pure commodity, if you're just treated like you know, this bottle of water, you're sold, or your, the price you earn is the price of your cost of production, which is the bare subsistence. But if you imagine yourself as a living, breathing human being, to be paid just your subsistence would make you pretty angry. Okay? You're going to demand more than that. You're going to organize, fight for a higher wage. So as a non-commodity, you're going to do something a commodity can't do, a pure commodity can't do, and that's demand a share in the surplus. So this conflict between being treated as a commodity and being a non-commodity, that foreground and background tension, means you're going to organize. You're going to want to get paid more. You'll have a struggle over the minimum wage, the social wage, etc., etc. So normally, because of that struggle, the wage is going to be greater than subsistence. 
And therefore, income distribution dynamics are going to be a natural part of capitalism. Because sometimes workers are going to be stronger, other times weaker. They're pretty weak right now. Okay? But historically, there have been periods of great strength, particularly after the Great Depression. So you do get this dramatic variation in the minimum wage, or the wage in general. So capitalist society, there's labour as your unity. The foreground aspect is you treat it as a commodity, but therefore you pay a subsistence wage. The background is you're not a commodity. You regale against it, you organise, you demand a share in the surplus, and therefore you're going to get distra- struggles over the distribution of income as a natural part of capitalism. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the, the words uh, foreground and background that, yeah. uh, that strike me a little. I mean, maybe it's a question of, uh, of English, but, uh, but if, you could, if you could just elaborate a, a little around the fact that you consider that something is, is, uh, is behind and something... Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's actually the words Marx... Well, I'm reading, the, of course, reading the English translation of yeah. Marx, okay. and they translate as foreground and background. Uh, what that really means is that the, the element that society focuses upon and the elements that it therefore ignores. Okay, So that's the basis. Society itself is the overall determinant. And I have a, a beautiful example of one of my favourite anecdotes. I've got lots of anecdotes. One of my favourites was 30 years ago, when I was younger than most of the people in this room, I took a group of journalists to China. And it was just at the time that the, uh, the trial of the Gang of Four was going on. Now, who knows what I'm talking about when I talk about the trial of the Gang of Four? I thought so. <laughs> Madam Mao, it hurt her. Okay, Mao's wife and a group of three were very hard line, and took over after Marx's death, and drove this you know pure socialist type uh, distortion. If you want to see a good movie about it, see Mao's Last Dancer. Beautiful movie about uh, a, a, a young, brilliant uh, dancer raised in that period, who then manages to escape to the United States. Brilliant, brilliant movie about that time. Brilliant book too. But anyway, we were there during the trial of Madame Mao and her three collaborators when Dong Xiaoping took over and began the transformation of China. And we were taken on a tour of the Imperial Palace, as everybody is. And when you're walking through, has anybody here been to Beijing? Okay. I'm not going to go there till I clear the air up again. It's, I, I, I went to Hong Kong recently. I couldn't stand the air in Hong Kong. I did not want to know what it's like in Beijing. Back then, you could actually breathe. The only thing you got in your mouth was cabbage fumes. If you go around in bicycle on those days. Anyway, we went to the to the Imperial Palace and there was an amazing artwork. So the, probably the most remarkable was a, a jade statue of a jade mountain. So you had workers pulling jade out of a jade mine, made in jade, which stood taller than the roof of this room. I'd say it was about eight metres tall. A piece of art they had. One other object they had was about the size of a, about the length of my forearm, bent over like so, made of solid gold, with on this surface here a mass of rubies, emeralds, diamonds that you've never seen the like of, diamonds up to that big. And one of the journalists, when they were looking at it, she said to me, Steve, what do you think it is? I said, it's obvious, Jane, it's a back scratcher. Ha, ha, ha. I walked away and she caught up with me about half an hour. They said, I asked one of the guards, it is a back scratcher. <laughs> now that's the classic instance of the, it's feudal society. Think about a feudal society. Who cares about the cost of producing something? You, your use value is the fo- thing you focus upon. You don't care that it took you know, $20 million effectively to make that back scratcher. Take a capitalist society. What you focus upon is the, is the exchange value. You want to make back scratches as cheap as possible and sell as many as possible. So you sell them for $2.50 and they're made of plastic. Okay? That sort of comp. Does that make more sense? Yeah. yeah. So that's, but back to this one, what you get out of this is a tension that gives rise to struggles over the distribution of income. And that provides an explanation for the model I showed you yesterday, Goodwin's cyclical model of the economy, because that was actually a once century birthday present from Richard Goodwin to Karl Marx. Because Goodwin was a Marxist, as well as a brilliant mathematician. He loved the model he found in Chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital, but it makes no sense for that actual model to be there in the the overall context of capital itself. 
what he has to say is things like this. Accumulation slackens in consequence of the rise in the price of labour. They were talking about this very dialectic because the gain of stimulus is blunted. And the rate of accumulation lessens. There's less, less profit. Um, but that therefore means that you slow down the economy and <coughs> wages start to fall. The price of labour falls back to a level that enables capitalists to make a profit and start investing again. And the economy takes off once more. I'm giving a verbal translation as I go of what Marx is writing there. But that vision of a cyclical economy was Marx's chapter 25 model that became Goodwin's cyclical growth model. Now I think on the next slide I have a, a translation of that. Let's see if I've done it here. No, I haven't. I, I must have put that in another slide. Okay. But that's that's the basic idea. There's a, there's a, can, you, can you follow the logic of Marx's words there? It is awkward. But there's that cyclical vision. Start with wages being too high for accumulation. So less investment takes place. So the economy slows down. So less labour is employed, but therefore more goes, if there's only two, two classes work, capitalists get more, therefore they can invest more, therefore the economy grows more, and you get a permanent cycle, not equilibrium. Effective demand is another important one, because it's all very well to make surplus commodities, and this is where the energy comes in, by the way. The only explanation for why we can make more outputs than inputs every year is we're exploiting free energy in the universe. That's why I say we've got to go beyond what I'm talking about here, because you can't say it's labour and capital that make surplus commodities, because effectively it's like making energy. And the laws of thermodynamics tell us, A, we can't make energy, and B, energy degrades over time. So the only way we can actually make more over time is by exploiting that flow of free energy from the universe, both energy from the sun, energy from supernova explosions, which is what nuclear power is all about, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. But here we have it. So Marx's theory that I started with to talk about where surplus comes from only explains how you can produce more outputs than inputs, while effectively assuming that free energy. How do you turn that into money? Well, he said you've got two circuits in capitalism. One is what he calls CMC dash, which is where you have a simple commodity and you exchange it for something else. So in my example, one, one tribe has the um, white leather and the other has pottery, so they exchange the two. Yeah? Why would it be C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-C-
it has to be turned from surplus commodities into surplus money. And then therefore at that stage of the circuit, you have a problem of realising the surplus you've made. It's all very well to manufacture the physical surplus, you now have to turn that into money. So that becomes a problem of realising your surplus, which is a real problem in capitalism, whereas the transformation problem that is what's dominated Marxists for the last hundred years is a non-problem. So he said, in order to be transposed into the general form, i.e. money, the use value, what you're producing, has to be presented in a specific quantity relative to current demand for it. And it's not the, uh, it doesn't arise from the labour value side of things, but from the use value, and use value for others. So again, here you have Marx talking about exchange value and use value throughout his logic as a major part of his economics. Whereas the, the interpretation of Marx that has dominated, that the labour theory of value thing, argues Marx doesn't use use value. I'm sorry, they haven't read Marx properly. It, embedded in his logic, it keeps on turning up at different levels. So he said, the barrier you've now got is to make surplus money, you have to exchange the surplus goods for cash. You have to do that somehow. And that's a very rich way of interpreting and actually preceding Keynes arguing about effective demand. Okay. There's got to be the effective demand for your product for you to actually be able to realise the surplus you've generated in production. So use value at this stage now dominates exchange value. The priority is swap. And you now have this idea of effective demand. There's your CMC circuit, commodity, money, commodity. The foreground is that the, the, the commodities have to be essential for sale. You, you have to have a use value. In this final stage, we're trying to turn the surplus commodities you've produced into profit. But you've generated them for a profit. So you could potentially fail to realise that surplus. And that happens to capitalists all the time. Surplus goods, etc., etc. So there's inverting the prominence of use value and exchange value. They flip around at this stage. And this raises money. Now this was some of the best work that Marx has done, was talking about money. And it wasn't talking about money as gold. That was an abstraction he used in the early pages of Capital just to not bring in the final complexities. But when he goes to the, a high level of logic, which turns up in theories of surplus value uh, and in volumes two and three of Capital, he says, well, how do we handle money? How does money fit into this schema? And money is essential, but you don't produce it by means of commodities. If you made money by using other commodities to make money, this guy and some of his mates would throw you in jail for forgery. Okay? So you can't make money using commodities. But at the same time, it is a commodity. So you have another dialectical tension. And he says, this is capital as capital, meaning money, is a commodity. And, but from that point on, if you tried to treat it as a normal commodity, everything you normally reach would be irrational in terms of looking at an ordinary commodity. So if you want to call interest the price of money capital, that's also irrational because imagine how much it costs to make money in double entry bookkeeping. You have a clerk, he writes a million dollars in the loan you owe to the bank and a million dollars in your deposit. That might cost about you know, two dollars of labour time. Are you going to be charged two dollars for a million dollars? No, okay? So there's something irrational about the pricing of money. And he says, how can a product have a price which is not its value, which is, he means the exchange value, cost of production. And his logic here, and again, you can see how he's really debating these issues. How can a sum of value have a price besides its own price? This is in the volume three of Capital. He says, what in solid, in fact, is its use value. What you're buying when you buy money is not its exchange value, but its use value, which is its capacity to produce profit. So the price you pay for money, or the price you'll pay for a loan, depends on your expectations of making a profit out of borrowing that money. So you get subjective expectations about the future and uncertainty becoming a part of how you determine the price of credit money. This is a much richer version of Marx than you'll get out of standard Marxist thinking, unfortunately. We wasted a huge amount of his insights here. So you have a dialectic of money on top of the dialectic of the commodity and the dialectic of labour. And looking at that one the same way, there's the MCM plus circuit. Here's money. 
The foreground is that it is a commodity. It's essential for exchange. The background is that it's not a commodity. You can't produce it in the sense you can produce other commodities by means of commodities. So it's the ten that results in its exchange value being set by its use value. So you now invert that logic once more. And it's not subjective. It's, it's a subjective... Whereas, whereas the previous versions of, of use value have sometimes been subjective, this is now an ob this is or objective rather in, in production. The use value of a worker is the physical capacity to produce output, which you can put a numerical value on. This is now subjective. What do I think I'm going to make if I borrow that money? So subjectivity expectations turn up as well. And this also raises with capital assets themselves. Because with machinery, let's say looking at a mine. Now I know you're looking at mining oil under a rainforest right now. The economic and philosophical issues galore in that particular issue. Well, what's the value of that oil? Now here Marx really showed his, the advantage of the way he thinks over a, a conventional labour theory of value idea because he quotes Ricardo and says the compensation given for a mine or quarry is paid for the value let's say oil in this case, which can be removed from them um, and has no connection with the original indestructible powers of the land. That's Ricardo. Normally, who Marx is seen as being a, a follower of or developing his ideas more further. But he says, no, there's a very significant connection with the original and destructible products of the soil. The word value here is as ugly as repaid himself with the profit was above. Another, another phrase where he attacked Ricardo for not understanding where profit comes from. But here he's saying you, you cannot say that the value of that resource you haven't yet exploited is equal to its value in the conventional sense of exchange value or labour value, as Mark would have said at the time, because there's no value in it. No work has gone into that oil as yet about no bit of prospecting. So its value is not the effort you've put into it. It's got to be something inherent in that object itself. So here he starts discussing Ricardo's the shortcomings of Ricardo's classical theory before Marx developed his own dialectical ideas. And he says, Ricardo never uses the word for value for utility or usefulness. Does he therefore mean the compensation you pay for a mine is equal to the labour put into getting it out? Which is, well, that invalidates his entire doctrine of value. This wonderful phrase here. <coughs> what does value mean here as it must do? The possible use value, and hence his prospective exchange value, of the coal or stone. Okay. So now you've got a subjective basis for valuing resources. Expectations turn up in pricing capital assets. And therefore the price of machinery as well is not entirely determined by the cost of production. So you can s I hope you get a feeling for how rich this vision of capitalism is. So for the value of capital assets is also set by use value and that therefore involves expectations and uncertainty all of which are turning up in Marx's logic. Possible use value, prospective exchange value. So we actually get about three or four value, sorts of price levels out of, out of Marx's vision. The first price level with the dialectic of commodity is where a surplus comes from. Commodities exchange at their values and you have a cost of production theory and you get a positive profit with the gap between use value and exchange value. Then you have the dialectic of labour which means that the Labor being paid its value is the minimum wage. So the wage of labor is normally going to exceed subsistence. And therefore you're going to get wage income distribution struggles coming out of capitalism. Money and capital mean that the exchange value is set by the prospective use value, which involves expectations and subjective valuations, which of course is going to give you volatile prices for capital assets, which is what we see in the real world. And it even goes further this is I often find a lot of Austrian economists try to adopt me as an Austrian. Well, I certainly have sympathy for some elements, but I start from a completely different theory of value, and you're probably the first class I've given that a coherent statement of. Uh, but what they do have is they talk about everything being based on, subject, based on subjective pricing. Well, there are certainly some commodities for which that's true. But what we call commodities are normally things which are produced for sale and are also used to produce other things already. And those are the things which ultimately are priced in the cost of production. They're established products. 
And Marx, that the, there are then other products which that doesn't apply to. And Ricardo gives a lovely instance here. He says there are some commodities which, even he says most commodities are priced in the cost of production, but there are some whose value is determined by scarcity alone, rare statues, paintings, etc., etc., wholly independent of the cost of production. Now that also applies, when you think about it, to new commodities, as well as to paintings by Van Gogh, etc., etc. The price you will put has no relation to the labour going into them. So what you get is a potential to say, here's a pricing mechanism for innovation. New products, when they first come out, are priced completely independently of the cost of production because they're not established commodities and they're not used as inputs to producing other commodities. So you will get the subjective pricing system for new products. And that gives the potential for the entrepreneur to disturb the mechanisms of production by bringing in a new product which will be profitable for them and disrupt the profitability of other industries. So you have society here, new products turn up. The foreground is that they're a non-commodity. They're not yet produced, used to produce other commodities. And the background is they are actually produced by commodities. So what you get is a price set by subjective utility, potentially. People's willingness to be early adopters and so on. Makes sense in this vision of Marx. So you get a, com a complex systems approach coming out of Marx. You get multiple conflicted but related price levels, normal commodities, which you can have input-output pricing for, but they're not in an equilibrium, obviously. Labor, where you're going to get a struggle over the minimum wage, and that's where Goodwin's theory comes from. Money and capital assets, where you're going to get cycles in, in the prices you put upon capital assets because of expectations, and of course you're going to borrow money to buy them. And then non-reproducible or, or novel products, where pricing will be entirely subjective. So that's uh, a pretty heavy first hour. Let's take a long coffee break and come back and talk about the next three or four. <laughs>